So my journey began the same way that all great journeys do, with a little bit of good old fashioned character customization. I slid my way into general info, went on the Macca's diet until I was a nice plump 93 kilos and made myself the maximum of 198 centimeters. I then set my first name to agent, my second name to 47, my nickname to assassin, my social media handle to real hitman, you know, to differentiate me from all those fake hitmen on social media, and my hometown to Fort Hood, baby because I'm so hood, baby. I then made myself 18 years of age, so I'd have a nice long career ahead of me, offing people inside of the octagon on live television for millions and millions of dollars. Now, After that, I set my stance to Southpaw because I'm a Southpaw in real life and went with a nice solid Muay Thai fight stance as my fighter's fighting pose. And I then selected Agitator as my walkout song because people are constantly telling me how agitating I am. And I very carefully looked through the list of presets to find the one that would ultimately become the canvas for my new masterpiece. Redheaded hipster idiot it was a pretty tempting choice, but finally, I went with Captain Bowlcut over here. He literally looks like a <laughs> wearing a pair of shorts and boxing gloves. Neither way, we went with a number zero all over, picked some nice pointy eyebrows, ripped off the mustache hair by hair, and spent some time deeply contemplating what it would be like if I were born a carpet instead of a man. Now, choosing a head was pretty hard, especially considering the number of amazing choices on offer. But finally, I went with this one. I like to call it the I drove into a cement wall on a motorbike at 300 miles per hour, banged up Mike Tyson head. And just like that, it was time to crack out the old hammer and chisel and get to sculpting the garbage tier dog crap hero that this video deserves. This is what I ended up with. <laughs> Anyway, after that, I gave myself two beautiful bright blue eyes and spent a good five minutes debating with myself as to why I shouldn't pick this for my body. I mean, really, why? It's beautiful, isn't it? Eventually, though, I decided to go with this one instead. Now, with that out of the way, I selected the pastiest, most vitamin D deficient skin color the game had to offer and got to making a suit so good that you'd never want to take it off. And even if you did, you couldn't anyway, because it was permanently tattooed onto your body for the rest of your life. I then slapped a barcode on the back of my head for a multi-pack of assorted dongle dingles from the adult lifestyle supermarket and got a top secret tattoo of Diana on my ass. But shh, don't tell anyone. It's top secret. And I spent my real life money to buy these stupid, stupid pants, which I then matched with these stupid, stupid gloves. Lastly, I selected this dope Irish mouth guard because there's a new Conor McGregor in town, mother after that, I made myself a kickboxer, which gave me the crazy legs perk, made me pretty mediocre in the stand-up department, even more mediocre in the ground game department, and utter dog crap in every other department. It also gave me access to some really, really low-level boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, and traditional combos. Simply put, I suck. And just like that, my journey began under some filthy bridge that stank of hobo urine in a legal cage match to the death somewhere in San Francisco. Now, because this fight is part of the career mode's narrative, you can't actually win, which explains why I was getting my butt whooped. But when the second round started, I was determined to break the game and win anyway, and decided the best way to do it was by pretending to be Bruce Buffer. Obviously, that didn't go exactly according to plan. However, the game did seem to be pretty impressed by the way I managed to fold myself in half like a lawn chair and offered to send me straight to the UFC. Now, I declined though and headed into the local MMA gym to take out my frustration for A, losing the fight and B, being so ugly by beating up the gym owner and taking over the gym for myself because I was too povo to afford a membership. Now, he was a clever one though and promised to help me find my precious ring. And there's a joke because I look like Gollum. So I spared him his life and promised that I would join the UFC and become the heavyweight champion of the world then give him my belt so he could sell it on eBay. We bumped fists, but as I walked away, I swear I heard him whisper, why are you wearing a shirt on top of that suit, weirdo? Now, my trainer thought it would be a good idea to stick me straight into an octagon with some other bozo in order to teach me the ropes, as it were. Instead, I broke the game and spent the next 30 minutes or so knocking the dude out repeatedly. Over and <laughs> over and over again. And with that done, it was time for me to return to the illegal underground smelly pee hobo deathmatch octagon for another fight. Now I got things started with the same idiotic taunt that got me flash KO'd in my previous fight, then lured him into range with a few steps back and a cheeky kick to the mouth, which I then followed up with a karate kid crane kick so smooth that it'd make Mr. Miyagi smile from the grave. And just like that, smash brothers time. 
he did. Now, as for the next fight, there's not much to say about that one besides the fact that I smashed his face in too, and the one after was even more embarrassing. But with three very dominant performances under the Smelly P Hobo Bridge, I was invited to join the Women's Fighting Association. Now, I was also asked what difficulty I wanted to play at, and we all know that as a proud and self-professing advocate for the importance of self-inflicted pain and suffering and character development of a grown alpha male man like myself, I chose Legendary. I am also a legend. I signed my Women's Fighting Association contract with a big yellow X and immediately noticed some red-headed bozo talking smack on social media. So I replied back politely. We started the fight with a nice warm cuddle. I then ate a cheeky spinning back fist that I didn't see, but fired back. Gave him a few more crushing knees to the good old rib cage. Boofed him in his tiny pee head repeatedly with some looping hooks. And then immediately got crash tackled to the floor. Unfortunately for him though, and completely unbeknownst to me, I knew jujitsu. Apparently Dana also rushed him straight to the second hand shop after the fight ended. <laughs> Zing. Next up, I had to smash some fat Brazilian dad who had no business being in the octagon with me. So I broke his arm too. And with my first two fights in the Women's Fighting Association going so well, I headed into my third where I pieced my opponent up with ease. And then for some really bizarre reason, I rejected my offer from the UFC and decided to stay in the WFA for the next 10 or so in-game years, dominating opponent after opponent and racking up Ws on my resume. Here's a brief montage of every KO as they happened in that time of my life, which was a very rewarding time for me and not for the other people in the octagon with me. They're actually all dead. Now, somewhere along my killing spree, I actually ended up fighting a chap called Samuel Cook, an Australian bloke who was the brother of Captain Cook, the bloke who discovered Australia. He was also the champion of the Women's Fighting Association. Not gonna lie though, this was a real fight. The dude wasn't as hopeless as everyone else I'd faced in the octagon up to this point. Matter of fact, he kneed me in the ribs a couple of times, slipped my front kick and landed a flush overhand to my ginormous head, and took turns with me at cracking each other in the mouth until one of us finally collapsed on the floor. Spoiler, it was him. I then hopped on top of him and rained down ground and pound until I was the baddest woman on the planet. And Loki, I think I might have also won the title of hottest woman on the planet too. Anyway, that title fight had me at 10 and 0, but I still wasn't done terrorizing the promotion yet. So I kept on going. Enjoy the brief KO montage that follows. Thank you, please. And with that out of the way, it was finally time to join the UFC. Now I slapped my big sloppy X on the dotted line and got ready to face my first opponent in the UFC, Alexander Volkov. He wanted to touch gloves. I said, no, 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 no. I cracked him in the head a couple of times. We did a roly poly. Then I sparked him so hard in the face that he literally flew across the octagon. It was epic. After that, I decided to call in some Turkish bloke to teach me how to do a very fancy spinny kicky thing for the extremely reasonable price of $60,000. It's also hilarious how laughably bad the character models are for any fighter that's no longer on the UFC's roster. But anyway, I learned how to do my cool spinny kicky thing, then paid another dude 90 Gs to teach me how to do a cartwheel, and gave 87 grand to another dude to teach me how to do a double flying knee. It was after wasting half of my life savings on learning three moves as a matter of fact that I got a DM from Uncle Dana telling me that Derek Lewis pulled out of our scheduled fight and that now I had the option to fight Francis Ngannou instead. Obviously I said yes, which had nothing to do with the fact that he was now 40 years of age and way past his prime. He put on the pressure and cracked me in my ginormous head and my rip dabs a couple of times, so I fired back with some torpedoes of my own and kicked him right in the ear. There was a moment though where he nailed me so good that my statistics permanently dropped in real life, but I got back up, spun around in a circle and whooped him in the mouth. Then I pounced on top of him and finished the fight with some hot, sweaty, man-on-man -man action. You know you've been starched real bad when you can't even blink anymore. Now, with Francis no longer living, I circled back to take care of Derek, who chickened out of our last fight together. Derek also happened to be the heavyweight champion. 
and 42 years old. I also apparently had major permanent brain damage, but for somebody with no brain, that's okay. Before the fight, my coach headed into the back room to give me a bit of a pep talk where he said things like, you are the ugliest person I have ever seen in my life. I've seen melons fall off the back of trucks that look more like heads than your head does. And every time I see you, I vomit a little bit inside my mouth. Then I cry for three hours. After that, we bumped fists and got ready to go to work. The first thing I noticed was that Derek had the glass-eyed stare of a man with dementia lost in the woods who had just crapped his pants and didn't know what day it was. Money. The fight started with this beautiful gem of a thing, whatever the heck it is, which I then followed up with a cracking spinning back fist that launched the sweat and blood straight off Derek's face and right onto Uncle Dana's. Derek then put his big belly on top of me and proceeded to patty cake me in the face while bleeding profusely and directly into my eyeballs, which completely unknown to him gave me power. So I picked myself back up off the floor and completely starched him. Hey Dana, look at my floppy arms. Now give me the bell, you bald <laughs> 